Thank you, everybody, from this morning. Very exciting to hear all of your contributions. My name is Victor. It's my friend Benzer, and we're here to talk about engineering beyond net zero. Uh, before flipping through the material and doing a short demo, there are mainly three things what we mean with beyond net zero and, and, and our company, See Beyond. Number one is, as we've already heard today, emissions beyond net zero isn't everything. There's much more to it. There's use of water, toxicity, social aspects. So net zero is good, but there is something beyond it. Second one is once we are net zero, we still have to be competitive. It, it won't help progress if we only are fully sustainable. We still need to know what is the performance and what is the cost of our product. So we need to go from a, from a one-dimensional focus to, to a three-dimensional. This is the equation that we want to, to, uh, to help solve. And the third one is, and some of you, um, our predecessors already mentioned it, is that in order to solve this huge challenge, we have to work together and we have to have objectivity from data and tools to have a common language, to get together in the industry, cross silos, but also cross tier levels, and also cross industries. So these are the three main bullets that we'll, that we'll dig into in the next 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, quick introduction. Uh, I'm Victor, CEO of Sea Beyond. I grew up in Heidelberg, not far from here, so very excited to be home. Uh, I moved, my first job was with uh, Fuchs Lubricants, uh, starting up the Swedish subsidiary. So I was sent there and basically stayed in the country because it's an, a really nice country and very on, on, the, on, the, on the edge for sustainability with a lot of good activities ongoing. So my background is from finance, corporate development, uh, facilitating business case decisions for investors, board members and, and leadership of OEMs, tier ones and tier twos in my past 10 years with an automotive. Most recently, I come from Höganäs, who's who's a world leader in material know-how. That's, that's where I spent the last two years. And as of this year, we started the company in December. And from February on, we're very excited to be here today. We're working in, in C Beyond and driving EPOP. So, but let's hand over to, to Benza real quick. Thank you, Victor. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, guy, uh, nice to meet you. Um, my name is Benza. I grew up not so close. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Budapest, Hungary. Um, and worked for uh, Knorr Bremse for a few years in their research and development departments um, before moving into the, to the UK. So that was a uh, good 15, 16 years ago now. Uh, and uh, over there, I've worked in the um, uh, Ricardo company, which you uh, may be aware of, uh, where I've been exposed um, to all aspects of the automotive industry. My background is in control simulation, um, control systems and simulation. Um, but there at Ricardo, we've been exposed to production, um, uh, end of line testing and other aspects of, of the industry. So that kind of helped me maintain a, a system level view uh, over the years. Um, and most recently I've joined, I had joined um, DSD or Drive System Design, which is a pioneering um, EV consultancy. Um, and from there, I, I've uh, moved to Z Beyond uh, just earlier this year uh, to set up the company. Um, and at the SD, I've been focusing on uh, simulation environments for optimization um, in the past three, four years. So there you go. That's the uh, engineer in the house. Yep. Thank you for welcoming me. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. So before going into EPOP, we want to just circle back and provide some some context, which I'm sure all of you in this room are aware of, but uh, and and all our audience online, which we will hopefully meet after the event. Uh, let's go back a hundred years when basically we relied on literal horsepower as the, the, the powertrain for vehicles. It was a very good power to weight ratio. Performance was good. Sustainability was really good, circular and and not such extreme emissions, but still emissions were very circular. Profitability was not so good because as good as the horse is, it lacked one crucial thing, an off button. So maintenance costs are very high regardless of use cases. So basically, when we went to combustion engine, not much changed. Just exchange a horse for, for combustion, which was great. 
And fast forward 100 years, we have the product on the road today, ICE, which is what we believe in the industry is the optimum combination of performance and profitability. However, it isn't very sustainable, which is part of the reason we're all here. What does this look like for our next challenge we have ahead of us? I think one thing is for certain, uh, with the data and the technology and, and science, if we add up the 100 years behind us, we'll probably see the same type of development in the next 10 years. Going back to your comment about the next two, three years, what will happen? So the only thing we're certain of, really, is that whatever we come up with, it has to be sustainable. We don't know yet what is the optimum combination of performance and profitability of those products. So this is an equation we're, we're trying to solve and, and we have to work together, as we mentioned, really. So let's look at how we work in organizations, uh, to how we have worked and how we will have to work going forward. So basically, at least myself and I think also Benzer and maybe some of you are used to working in two-dimensional problems with where finance and investors trying to understand the, uh, the engineers and vice versa. So you have uh, large teams, you have many projects, long lead times, big capital investments. And on the other side, you have the, the, uh, the generalists, really, that, that also include um, CFOs or, or investors, owners, and, and controllers, which are really relevant for driving these decisions forward and selecting the optimum platform going forward. What we see now to solve the sustainability equation to, in the three dimension we discussed, we now have to embed sustainability, not just in our sustainability reports, in the early stage platform development, when we select our future product. And that is what we do in the strategy, usually. You have a, a strategy and you, you look, where is my value proposition? Now we don't only have to do it from profit and performance, we have to also consider life cycle analysis. So not only net zero, all the impacts. So let's take a brief look at, in order to solve this, who are the people behind it, right? And how is the strategy defined? So usually performance, profitability, and sustainability would maybe be, be represented by a chief engineer, uh, maybe a CFO and a, and a CSO or, or, or LCA expert. And usually they would have their respective organizations and you would have other organizations that also need to be part of the, the solution. Um, and then to build a strategy house, you have people, core values and processes and, and you top it all up with a long-term, oh, sorry, sustainability is fully embedded, of course, in the strategy. And uh, then you have targets of emission free, you have new materials, new products, all sorts of ambitious uh, agendas where you need to work together. And this is where EPUB comes in. So we believe that we need a common language. We need an intuitive tool so non-engineers can understand and see the trade-offs. And we need, we need ways to, to talk to each other in an objective way to eliminate politics uh, when you define your strategy, to let the data tell the most efficient and sustainable solution. So how do we do that? Um, normally, if you define a strategy, you would look at, okay, where to play, how to win, what is our future value proposition, which is, at least in my experience, quite difficult to identify if you're an OEM or tier one, tier two, with a disrupted market, what will my value proposition be if I have zero experience from the products? So you could, you could take, for example, traditionally, if you're a component supplier and supply a motor or a battery or a transmission or an inverter, which are the crucial components of an, of an e-drive system, you would look at your component and see, okay, we can go for recycled materials, we can Increase, uh, increase performance or efficiency. But what is, EVs are much more holistic than ICE vehicles, which is why the synthesized system, so the cake pieces are one scenario, is much more important. What are the, the, the synthesized uh, performance and, and cost and sustainability aspects instead of just the components? And traditionally, you would be able to afford one, two, 
maybe four of those scenarios, which you would conduct a feasibility study on. If you have to go into hardware, building prototypes to validate your value proposition, it could take up to years to validate your platform idea and say, okay, let's, do, let's build this product. So what we do with EPUB, we sweep the space for tens of thousands of options, and we put it all in an intuitive user interface, which engineers have built and, and have the machinery for, and is working in an office environment outside engineering. Then what we do when we have all the data in one tool, we're able to structure it for whatever we think is relevant, be it the investment, cost, profitability, performance, efficiency, we're able to structure it, filter, so talk or what are my LCA uh, goals, you filter out scenarios, and then you're able to embed which materials or solutions are more recyclable, which uh, parts are better uh, deassembled for recyclement, which are toxic. You're able to structure all three dimensions in one tool. That's what we call then the common language that you will find scenarios what your strategy best aims at. This is what we do in an iterative loop in a number of weeks rather than years, which lets you sweep the space for an optimum solution. Right. So we'll have a short demo now, right? Before that, let's look at the tools out there. So we have generalist tools, such as me myself would use, specialist tools. We have technical specification where a lot of the LCA tools are today, which are really good at assessing the life cycle assessment, but they struggle to tell us about the other two dimensions. What is the performance of the product? What is the cost? So in order to really use these tools, you need to consider all three. We have very technically advanced design tools that we're looking to cooperate with that are also very specific on a component or even a system level, but don't necessarily work in, a, in an outside R&D environment. So that's where we see EPUB. Technically advanced enough and in order to collaborate with all tools out there because the challenge is huge and we need all the help we can get. Uh, yeah, Benson, maybe you tell us more about the okay. history of EPUP. Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, before we go into the demonstration, um, uh, just a little bit of background into how EPUP evolved and what were the driving factors. So, uh, back in 2018, the, um, the entire simulation environment was born as a concept. Um, out of necessity, I must say, because you know, almost for a second, forget about engineering and sustainability and all these different departments in engineering in, it, in its own right, there was a need for a system level view and an optimizing strategy. Um, so for purely engineering use at the beginning, we have created a tool to help the different sub departments within the engineering environment, such as the, you know, motor designers and transmission designers talk to each other and speak the same language. Um, so, uh, very quickly after that, we started putting more and more fidelity into the tools, uh, into the models in there, um, and we started uh, looking at different motor technologies to be considered, um, uh, as well as other components uh, and their sensitivities. Shortly after that, we understood that the need for this tool was very strong and very, um, <clears throat> very much needed. So we have gone basically and said, well, look, yeah, that's fine. We can do 10, 20, 100, maybe 200 simulations. Uh, that's great. But no, we need a lot more. We need to be looking at thousands. Um, you know, there's many, many variations that we want to look at. So instead of doing thousands, we said, well, why not do 10,000 or 50,000? So that was the next step. We introduced some uh, automation here, uh, batch running, and very quick evaluation of uh, design spaces. And then most recently, we've uh, effectively understood after performing uh, a couple of projects in this space that the, um, the hard work that we put in on the engineering side up front um, really pays off if we just increase that boundary and just step outside engineering world uh, and step into the even larger system, which now includes uh, finance and sustainability. 
Okay, so here we are today. Uh, that's why we're here. We are convinced that the proven um, work that we've done in the engineering environment, which has uh, produced you know, many customer projects um, and well over a million individual powertrains that we've synthesized over the years, um, is, is now ready uh, to be taken to the next, step, next stage. Okay? Good. Right, so one last thing <laughs> before we go and demonstrate some of the capabilities here. Uh, we're going to show you a, uh, a compressed version of our tool because obviously to go through a, a typical study that would take a number of weeks, but uh, we, we try to demonstrate that for you in just a couple of minutes. So you'll see a compressed version, but before you do, I wanted to make, uh, make you aware of the kind of level of detail that is available underneath, under the hood. So let's take a, peek, a sneak peek under the hood here. Um, we, we've got major components in EV systems. Uh, typically, the inverter, the motor, and the transmission are the largest of those for electric drives, um, excluding the battery for the moment. So these are dynamic components. Uh, and if I let, let me just pick on the transmission for a minute. Uh, if I pick on the detail there, we have got uh, automatic sizing of uh, components, uh, gears, bearings, shafts. Um, and so we, we understand what the uh, gear geometry is, what the uh, macro geometry is, what the efficiency maps are based on the losses that we calculate, um, what the masses are, what the inertias are. Um, <clears throat> and that's the level of detail you can expect for the transmission itself. Now, you will be seeing some actions that we do in, in this compressed version, uh, but just, just so you know, under the hood there, there's a lot of technical detail going on, um, which we didn't want to bore you with, <laughs> if that makes sense. Not today, anyway. <laughs> All right. So, um, yep. Victor will be driving and I will be... Yeah, instructing. Isn't instructing, yes. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a, an example study, um, which we're going to walk through to demonstrate to you the process that we might elect to use when we try to optimize across all of those different disciplines. So firstly, let's say, let's say we're an OEM and we would like to create an electric, uh, electric vehicle. So let's go for automotive, uh, let's go for a mid-size, let's say B-segment vehicle. Uh, once we've defined our vehicle, uh, next step would be to basically also define requirements. Um, you know, how do we want this vehicle to perform? These are very simply um, defined engineering requirements. Uh, Victor is just making some selections there. Uh, things like the, what range we'd like the vehicle to have, what kind of top speed or acceleration we want. Uh, 3,500, that's a, that's a sporty B segment. Okay. You have to have fun as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. While saving the world. <laughs> All right. So these are the, uh, the core engineering targets that we like the vehicle to, to adhere to. And at this point, we can also make selections on uh, sustainability related targets, such as uh, emissions or that's emissions in use um, or recyclability or toxicity, toxicity indexes. Okay. So we're basically ready. We've defined the application on a target. Um, and in the next step, we are now ready to calculate what is the, what's the power source requirement, okay? So now we can perform a calculation, no understanding the vehicle and the, the core requirements. We can perform a calculation that will tell us what is the wheel torque requirement for my vehicle, okay? Uh, as the speed of the axle, uh, the output goes up, I need torque to behave in this way. Um, and then I can elect to say, right, uh, well, let's go for a single motor driving this vehicle, being a B-class, and let's, let's have a, a single speed transmission. Uh, what the tool will do in this case is, for an example ratio, it will calculate the motor performance that we need in order to propel the vehicle. Uh, there's a quick, quick pictorial de demonstration as there, as, there as well for sizing. 
uh, we're expecting a mid-size motor with a, a small transmission to go with this layout. We can also input other options. For example, let's stay with one motor again uh, and two transmissions, uh, two transmission gears. Uh, so that's a two-speed transmission. In this case, we've got a downsized motor, which is smaller in size, at the expense of a slightly, long, slightly longer transmission. Uh, and what that does is it, this particular layout covers the wheel torque requirement just the same, except it makes it happen from two different gear states. May I chime in quickly? So why is it relevant to assess motor sizes and transmission sizes from a sustainability point of view? Is that we're, if, we, if you have different materials, recycled materials, different uh, applications, you will, have, you will be able to achieve your, your emission targets if you know what, what is the, the component I need to use. Uh, this, this is why we want to sweep the space for as many options as possible to embed that. But go yeah. ahead. Yes, because on the engineering level, we, I'm, I'm fundamentally achieving the same output here, right? The, uh, both layouts can achieve the same performance from an engineering perspective. However, if I use different size components and match them together, and I have an understanding of the weight of steel, for example, in the transmission, or the weight of magnets and other critical components in the motor, and I can assign uh, sustainably related metrics to those components, then I can actually objectively compare those two options, not just on an engineering level, but also in the sustainability world. All right. So, once we've got our setup, we're, we're going to basically define a very small design space here. We're going to uh, pick a battery type. Um, we're going to go for a couple of motor technologies, uh, maybe PM assisted. Then we run our study. So once we've run our study, we can see the results. Now, each of these colorful dots you can see on the right, they each represent a unique powertrain solution. Okay, they're, they're each, each one has a different uh, motor, perhaps, or a different inverter, different transmission ratio. They all vary in different ways. And what we can do now is we can start and look at this data um, in more meaningful ways. Well, firstly, we're going to want to filter down <clears throat> on the performance. So we apply some filters to be in line with our requirements, which is, um, you know, 3,500, was it, Newton meters, uh, 160 kilometers per, kilometers per hour, and eight seconds acceleration time, not 200. Now, what this does is it fundamentally removes the powertrain candidates or proportion systems that, are, that were simulated, and now we're left with just the relevant ones. Okay, so if we go to the filtering down. All right, so now I'm, I'm engineering, okay? Let's pretend for a moment that I'm, I'm representing engineering. And I may want to look at the same exact data we had plotted, but in different ways. Um, you know, going back to the mass argument, uh, reducing weight might be interesting and important for engineering. Therefore, they might want to look at the data in this way, where they compare volume to mass. Or, or indeed, to compare energy consumption to powertrain mass, right? And when we do that, um, we want to be as small in the energy consumption as possible, as small in powertrain mass as possible, and that defines a 2D curve called the Pareto front in the optimization world, um, which contains all of the optimal solutions. So the answer is not one, one solution, the answer is all of those points along those lines. Now, engineering will want to look at more data, okay? They will not be happy with just a couple of colorful dots on a plot. It's just not, not going to happen. So uh, we've got capabilities here, which will not bore you with, but we can drill down and we've demonstrated to you here that any of these selected powertrains can have all of the underlying data uh, displayed for them uh, and shown directly. Okay, so I, me as an engineer, I can interrogate the data, I can rejig it, and I can look into details. And I can say, right, uh, engineering, blue-blooded blue engineers, okay, so we've got blue-colored selections. These are my favorites, okay? I'm representing engineering. Now, um, we now move on to, say, 
finance, yeah. if Victor, you're in finance, what would what would and your favorites be? Exactly. Normally, we would meet and you would show me uh, some technical graph and tell, convince me why I need to invest in, in something like that. With, with EPOP, I can um, change the plot because we have the same data. So I can go for CapEx and uh, FPC, for example. And immediately I see, well, Ben says, sorry, your third idea is just not going to fly because it's way too expensive for the, for the, for the FPC. Uh, I, can, I select it now um, CapEx, FPC, as well as different footprint scenarios, where again, our, not only our full production cost comes into play, but also our emissions, energy sources, as well as frights, not to mention the C bands that's coming into play now for Europe, uh, which I then can plot, which, because I've given all of these systems in the first step a different um, uh, specification of those aspects. And I can then go and say, well, actually, Ben, sir, I like these two because it's the least amount of combination uh, of what I need to invest and still achieve your uh, performance and, and at a relative, relative good uh, FPC. And I will be able to look at business cases, P&Ls, and, and so on and so forth. And you come from finance, so obviously you're black in your country. Exactly, exactly. And German, black and white, yeah. <laughs> so very, very good. All right. So um, moving on, you know, now we, now we have basically remembered the selections from different functions. We still know, we can reject the data, but we still know what the favorites were for each function. Um, and there might be another function coming in let's say sustainability function might come into play and we'll say well actually guys hang on uh, yeah you've been playing so far but let me have a go so uh, the, you know which is which will be most people in this room i presume wanting to do such uh, analysis so you basically look at the data and from your perspective if you're looking at say toxicity um, versus uh, co2 emissions you will have again a different preto front to look at and but you're green in color scheme, right? So a sustainability function will be able to select their favorites um, and their priorities. Okay. Then so what does this mean? We, this means we've got, um, we now have to sit down, all three parties, if you like, have to sit down and look at that same data again together and come to a compromise. Design means compromise by definition. So we have to come to compromise here. Um, uh, and let's say that we would select something down here, um, which is kind of a, an average of all of those other, other selections. So uh, of course, this was a shorthand and a compressed version for what the real process might look like. Um, but hopefully it explains to you uh, our vision here and how we would like to provide a language and a method that everybody in the organization can use to look at the same data, to remove the arguments, really. We fully understand what we're stepping into here, <laughs> trying to separate, you know, remove the political divide, but uh, still, it's, a, it's our obligation to do so if we can. Yeah, good. Thank you, Ben, sir. So going back to our three characters or three-dimensional problem, now that we've seen and learned about the tool, we're able to go back and find and manage that end game uncertainty of which technology will prevail. Will it be fuel cell, battery driven? What will be the end game be of, of our, our next generation platforms? We're able to sweep the space. We're able to say which one is most favorable to us. And then we're able to build consensus around it, depending on our strategy or what our investors or our target investors might be looking for. And hopefully you'll be able to make decisions and, and we personally hope that the, the, the third and, and new, new uh, function to, to the party will, will prevail, uh, make decisions. If you won't, then it's easy uh, to go back in an iterative loop and change the assumptions. Okay, what if we tweak here? What if we tweak over there? You can do it in one iterative loop and tool, which, which is um, really why we, what we think is important to decarbonize the industry, again, why we're here today. So what we show you is what we believe and we can apply for each and every step of the, of the life cycle and with the material know-how of recycled uh, impacts on performance and cost, we're closing the loop from cradle to cradle 
usage is, is a bit gray because we cannot um, determine 100% what electricity the vehicle will be charged with during its lifetime. We can simulate it, but we cannot determine it. And because we believe each and every one of us is unique and there is a unique place in the future for everyone's application, we have the EPO process, but we are strictly lean with it. So what we call an early adopter program is we, we have the EPO process, we sit down with OEMs, tier ones and tier twos, we present the process and they say, okay, can you solve my equation with thermal management or these recycled uh, uh, materials? Or we have to source from a different country. What does that mean for my performance? This is why we are strictly lean, both in building CBEYOND and EPOP. We learn, build and measure. And we do this constantly in every level of the company. Yeah, and that's to sum up, last slide again. We believe in the uniqueness. We will to navigate the disruption. We have to listen to our customers. We have to, there won't be, be one solution for all. But in order to navigate the, the climate uh, goals, objective data synthesis and a common language to go with it, these two simple parts is what we think is required. Yeah, and we hope you come down to our booth downstairs to, to challenge us to to solve the equation between sustainability, profit, and, and performance. Thank you. Thank you.